Hi, welcome to the Existential Stoic Podcast, episode 24. I'm Danny. I'm here with my buddy, Randy. Hey, Danny. Hey, Randy. And today we're going to talk about how to deal with people. Ugh, people? Fucking people. Gosh, not those people. Those people. Ugh. All those people. Yeah, I think it's a timely episode. I had to deal with some people this week. I've had to deal with people every day. You know what? <laughs> That's pretty much life. You know, Bruce Lee says that life is a constant process of relating. Oh, I like that. Yeah, he's a smart dude. I it can't is. believe he passed at 32. He did? Yeah. I did not know that. That's insane. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Like, it is a constant process of relating. And, you know, it's funny because when you talk about people, too, we also define ourselves based on the other. I mean, you know, based on looking at other people, understanding their life, the world around us, we also understand ourselves better, right? So dealing with people, I think, is crucial because it's also in part how we understand ourselves. Yeah. I mean, if you want anything in life, you're going to have to deal with people. Yeah. I mean, I worked for a long time in veterinary medicine and everybody gets into that because they don't want to deal with people. And that's like (laughs) the biggest mistake ever because I never met a pet who pays for their own appointment. They don't. And you know, it's funny. They can't make the appointment either. Can't do that. They can't do much of anything. Can't tell you what's going on. You know, it's crazy too because communication, I think, like, I love writing. Communicating is so interesting because I think, you know, it, it's interesting trying to be clear, thinking about what you say, how it affects you, how it affects others. But I think most of the time we're not thinking about that at all. You know, people think about only themselves. They think about only, you know, their own perspective, their own attitude, and that's all that matters to them. Yeah, communication is tough because there's what you mean to say, there's what you actually say, there's what's heard, and then there's what's interpreted from what's heard. Yeah, and you factor in all the body movements and gestures and everything else. That and might considering be what you actually yeah. say only accounts for like 10% of the meaning. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it's, kind of, it's kind of cool though because it's also, you know, it's, it's the basis for which we understand ourselves in this world. But so. that's communication, so we're off topic. We Back are to already. People. <laughs> Back to people. Man, already off topic, and that was only like 10 seconds. I know, right? Anyway, so you had an experience this week, one that I think a lot of people would relate to. Oh and in gosh. fact, I relate to because I feel like the last couple of years I've been dealing with this a lot with people that I thought I knew and liked. Yeah. So you wanna, do you want to explain yeah, it? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. So, so there's this guy who's, who's been a friend for a while. And the last few times I've talked with him, it's just been like a drain. I get off the phone and I feel terrible. And then this time... He messaged me. He's like, yo, dude, let's let's chat. And I, and I got all excited again because he was a friend. <laughs> yeah. And I go and literally like two minutes of talking with him. And I feel like an absolute turd. And I just hung up. And he's like, what the, what the F? And I was like, dude, the last couple of times we've spoken, I feel terrible. I'm just done with this. And he's like, wow. <laughs> As if you did something yeah. so wrong. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's eye-opening because, you know, they say, like, birds of a feather flock together. So you gotta, you got to wa- see who you're spending time with because otherwise you're going to wind up with that, like them. And I don't want to spend my time around people who I don't benefit from spending time around. Yeah, like, who are negative, right? Who have that attitude where they want to just suck you in and bring you down. Yeah. And you see it so often. It's funny, just this week, um, my fiance's uh, mom went to visit her friends and came home totally upset. Because one of her friends started some bullshit. I don't know all the details, but what I do know, it was a bunch of drama started because the other woman was apparently apparently upset with her own relationship with her kid, so decided to pick fights with her supposed friends, right? In order to make them feel worse. And it's like, you know, it's funny. I had mentioned to you when we when you when we had talked on the phone about this that you know, uh, Dostoevsky has this part in Notes from Underground where he talks about you know, and that's more tongue in cheek, but you know, like having a toothache and wanting to make other people feel miserable because you feel miserable. Did you, was that a pun, tongue in cheek, yeah, because it's yeah. a toothache? Right. Man, that was just <laughs> Pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, he's right because they say that hurting people hurt. And so, like, you know, maybe he's not intentionally doing it. Maybe he just is not feeling good and by making other people feel bad, he can feel better. But, like, that's kind of like, you know, if you want to have the biggest building in town, there's two ways to do it you can tear down everyone else's building or you can just big build the biggest damn building in town i like that man yeah. it's nice and, yeah. and i'm a big fan of building the best building like after i had this incident i was so frustrated because i knew the past couple times that i spoke to him i felt like a turd afterwards yeah and yet i spoke with him again and i was so disappointed in myself but i called up i called you up and we spoke for like five minutes yeah and all of a sudden <laughs> felt better again like 
all the problems were gone, and I was like, oh, geez. It was funny. Day. It was actually funny, too, because when you called me, I wasn't feeling good, and I felt better just having spoken to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny how that works, how certain, and, you know, it's a, it's a great example of how certain people, it almost doesn't even matter what, like, you called with a specific reason, but we just talked, and, like, I felt better anyway just because I spoke to you, and, like, we have a good relationship. You know, I always feel better when we see each other. It's awesome, you know? And I think it makes a sharp distinction between those types of interactions and ones with people where you always feel terrible afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like one of my siblings is like that. He's very negative. And it sucks because, you know, part of me loves him. But the other part, it's like every time I talk to him, it's like he just brings me down. And like, you know, it's hard to get a word in edgewise. And everything is always seen from this attitude of just, you know, pessimism and negativity. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't really combat that with reason. It doesn't work. You can't rationalize your way around that because, unfortunately, that person's stuck in interpreting the world that way. Yeah. And, and so the difficulty comes in that we feel obligated to continue relating to that person. You know? Like, I felt obligated to respond to his text because we were friends. And you felt obligated to continue interacting because you're family. Yeah. And these obligations where we feel we have to continue interacting with these people. But that's kind of a scarcity mindset. Well, you know what's funny, too, just on that note? Mm -hmm. Nietzsche says, um, he says, human beings were like camels. We burden ourselves. We hurt ourselves the most because we burden ourselves with all this foreign crap. And we just keep taking it on, all these obligations and all these ideas about how we should act that really just hinder us and hurt us and weigh us down. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very true, right? Because like you said, family, the idea of friendship, all these things that we think we need to keep interacting. Work with, responsibilities, yeah. uh, friends of your children's parents, <laughs> yeah. you know, like all this stuff that we think we're supposed to do. And here's the thing. You were talking earlier when we were off topic about communication, how like we define ourselves through other people. Oftentimes we take on these uh, these mindsets that we're supposed to be a certain way, like we're supposed to be accepting of everybody, and we're supposed to we're supposed to be friends with our children's <laughs> uh, parents, and we're supposed to we're supposed to have these perfect families because we think that's what we're supposed to do, as opposed to that actually means something to me that's worthwhile. Yeah, you know, I think this is the interesting thing, right? Is if we're honest with ourselves we can really address our relationships in a much healthier way. Dude, it's such an easy thing when yeah. you're honest with yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like, if they make you feel bad, don't deal with them. If they make you feel good, deal with them. And, you know, I think the difficulty here, too, and I think I, I guarantee you a lot of people are thinking that are listening right now, they're thinking, well, wait, so anytime my friend puts me in a bad mood, I should just walk away? And I don't think that's necessarily what we're saying. But, like, you know, you can give people a chance. You can be there for them for sure because everybody ha is going to have a bad time. They need to vent. But there's a difference between, you know, if I call up Randy because I'm having a bad day or I've had a bad week and I want to talk, I'm not going to bring him down in that conversation. You know, he might feel bad for me or he might be worried about me. There is a difference between that and intentionally trying to bring someone down to my level. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a crucial distinction. Yeah. But it's not always easy to see or understand. Definitely. Yeah. So, it come, I mean, it comes back to this idea of being intentional with your life. And kind of deciding what you want. And it, you know, it, like I said, after that conversation with this old friend, I was like angry. I was angry. I could tell you were, yeah. Like I was <laughs> angry. And not so much at him, but I was angry with myself because I, I felt like I let myself down. And, and I let somebody else affect how I was feeling. And that really pissed me off. I like that though because you know what it's a recognition that you know you should be in the control of your attitude one right two you're mad at yourself not because of what he said because you kind of could have expected it and almost you should have expected it right mm -hmm. so you weren't honest with yourself you let that you let that emotional connection of old friend kind of get in the way of what you knew would happen the rational thing and you know that's the difficulty though right because when we say oh old friend we want to always give them another chance we want to always say well maybe this time I won't be upset because there was something about them that I used to like. So it's like this difficult line of trying to understand, you know, do we, I mean, I guess the other thing is, do we help them when we talk to them? I mean, when we let this go on, no. is it helping? I would say I no. Think so. I would say, because there's this saying that I always say that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You can't, okay. you can't bring something to anyone if they're not, if they're not open to receiving it. 
No, you can't. I was focusing on the rhyme and then, yeah, <laughs> if, I got if lost. If it rhymes, it's got to be true. <laughs> yeah, it we know that. If it rhymes, it's got to be true. But, uh, yeah, so basically, if somebody doesn't want to improve, if they don't want to get out of their situation, there's nothing that you can do to get them out of their situation. So until they actually want to change, I think oftentimes you're just wasting your own energy. And it's what I was saying before with having like a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset in terms of relationships. Because like we said, life is a constant process of relating. And there's there literally is an infinite number of relationships you could have. There's oh, 9 yeah. billion people on earth. And you could have relationships in any type of way with any of these people. There's infinite possibilities. But when we get trapped in this obligation to relate with this person and that person and that person, it's a scarcity mindset because it's like, I'm very limited in this. I have to do this. And it closes off all the other possibility out there. You know, it's funny too that you mentioned that because um, Aristotle, when he talks about friendship and he talks about true or perfect friendship, he mentions that, you know, really we can only maintain a few of those because they take a lot of work because, you know, and they're very positive and they're very healthy, but they take a lot of effort. You know, we have this, but there seems to be this idea nowadays, and I don't know if it's just social media or whatever, you know, the idea of having all these acquaintances, all these people that follow oh, dude, and stuff. It's totally, it's totally due to Facebook. Like, you remember yeah. when, <laughs> when it was a social signal to have the most number of friends? Yeah. You know, and then there was, like, people who maxed out the number of friends that they could have. <laughs> and, and that's where it came about, because before then, who the hell cared? Like, you, you just had your friends. Like, you were just buddies. Yeah, you had a but core then, group or something like that or whatever, yeah, yeah. But then all of a sudden, the smartest scientists that we have in the world figured out how to monetize our friendships and how to basically get us addicted to social approval. So we're now addicted to having the most number of friends, having the most people watching us and liking our posts and checking us out. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because you see it, right? You see the lack of quality and that's really what affects people because they don't really have, you know, when you just focus on quantity, you don't have anyone you can really talk to. You don't have anyone you can really be honest with. And instead, you're left dealing with people day to day that are really either don't care that much about you, not right for you, or only interested in you because of some other gain that they're getting rather than just in the friendship itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I always liked. Aristotle, in the lower forms of friendship based on utility or pleasure, he says they're you know, what binds the relationship is what you're getting out of it. You get some usefulness or some pleasure out of the relationship. Yeah. Whereas a true friendship, you like the person for their own sake. You yeah. wish them well for their own sake, right? And there's a huge difference between those two. Yeah. So how, how should we deal? I mean, I think this is crucial because I think, you know, how should we deal with people that do bring us down that have a negative attitude? We mentioned one thing, right? Which is if it's repetitive, if we know it, if we can expect it, obviously sometimes the best decision is just to walk away, to stop. Cut them out. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Make a decision, just cut them out. I honestly think, too, cutting them out can be beneficial to them, too, because it might make them more aware of what they're doing, of their impact. Yeah. Maybe not now, Because hopefully. it's probably not only you that they're using like this. I doubt it, It's right? probably every relationship. They're hanging around people that they can manipulate, that they can use just for their own benefit because it makes them feel good. It does, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true. We feel, you know, when you're in a bad mood, you know, there is this sort of, it feels good to be around people in a similar mood. You Misery at, loves company. It does, right? Look at like, I, I was thinking about this when we were talking about it too, with like politics. You watch all these people freaking out about the election. It's like they look for other people freaked out about the election so they can freak out together. Yeah, it's called outrage porn. Yeah. <laughs> like literally that's, that's what news does nowadays is outrage porn. They, they make a very polarized statement and then they get people that are outraged with that statement. And then they broadcast that so other people will be outraged at the people's outrage. <laughs> yeah. And that's called outrage porn. And that's all it is anymore. Yeah. But it's like these like these very knee-jerk emotional reactions, responses, not rational, not thoughtful. And the people themselves are not really in control. It's really problematic when you think about it. It's very unhealthy. Yeah. So I like to... I mean, you were asking how we can, how yeah. we can choose with people. And I like to always come back to the idea that you are the sum, the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And and even in, you know, this year especially, I don't particularly look at those people as physical people. I look at that as whose influence am I spending the most time in? Oh, and, I like that. Okay. And for me, a lot of times that was like positive audiobooks. 
You know, I would listen to the same audiobooks or same read the same material over and over again because I knew that was one of the five people who was contributing to my average. I really like that you brought that up, right? Because we often forget that with communication, I can spend time with somebody without physically spending time with the person. I can read a book. I can listen to a podcast. I can engage in so many different ways now with a person without them actually engaging back. And you know, it's funny, reading philosophy a lot of times, I always find one method to better understand a philosopher's point of view is have a fake conversation with them. Imagine their response based on their, their you know, what they're writing, what their theories are, and it really puts you in their mind as well and helps you sort of engage in a positive discussion about the material. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and also, like, when you have decisions in life, like, we talked about this before, kind of having a little mastermind and kind of asking them what they would do in your situation is super helpful to, to figure out the best thing to do. And those are all forms of interacting, communicating, right, and being social beings that we are, I think. Mm-hmm. So that's good, right? So you don't have to interact. I mean, choosing those five, I like that idea of five people, but really, like, five personalities, you might even say. Mm-hmm. You know, whether they're real or whether they're you're engaging through some other means, like through media or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's not it's not always uh, sunshine and rainbows when it comes to this, because in order to choose the five people that you're <laughs> going to spend your time around, you need to to say goodbye to some other people. You know, I think this is the thing we struggle with the most is saying no, is mm-hmm. being intentional asserting our agency and saying no to obligation and saying no to relationships that are fundamentally bad for us or fundamentally bringing us down, right? In some important ways, because I, I noticed that myself in the last couple of years, like I've minimized the people I interact with. I've been interacting more with like, you know, books, media, you know, spending more time with you. And I think it's helped me a lot. And it's, but it's hard. It is very hard because in a way it's like, you know, Nietzsche always talked about like self overcoming is destroying your old self. And it does feel like that sometimes because it feels like you're hacking away at your old way of life, right? Mm-hmm. And you're chopping it down at the knees and it's a difficult transition to make. And, and oftentimes it's against what society says is right. Oh, it's always against it, right? Because yeah. they say always go back, right? The, com- the idea of the community is being this bound thing that you can never leave mm-hmm. or never, you know, move away from, but you'll never progress if you stay with that forever, right? Yeah, yeah times have changed. It's definitely not the same that it was, that it once was. And we need to be able to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're dealing with difficult people, I think, or dealing with people in general in your life, how do we find people that are a good influence on us or are positive? Because I think that's also difficult. Like, you know, it's funny, like, I'll take our relationship, for instance, like, we've been friends forever. I mean, you know, met at the teat, as they say, (laughs) you know, but really, we've been friends for so long. And it's funny that, you know, in high school and stuff, I guess you don't really think about it. But it was like later in life that I realized how good our friendship was and the value of our friendship. It wasn't it like dawned on me one day that I didn't, you know, it's almost like you took it for granted before. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting how that works. And when you start, I think one way to do it is start really thinking about the people you interact with and asking yourself, you know, when I interact with them, do I feel like a better person? Do I feel like myself? Or do I feel this like, influence or tug from them to be otherwise or to be different. I think that is one good indication. If you feel outside of yourself or not yourself when you're interacting with these so-called friends, family, there might be an issue there. And I think they're not always issues that you have to walk away from. They might be able to be addressed with honesty and open conversation, but that is difficult these days, I think, often, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, but I think you're right on point with, with trying, with identifying with the feeling because one thing that I was going to say is like sometimes you have to listen to like the very quiet voice inside of you. Yeah. Like I can I can honestly tell with all the positive relationships in myself that when I'm relating with that person, everything inside of me is screaming yes. Yeah. And and the people who it's not like that, there's always like, oh like you feel <laughs> that you feel the tension, you feel the nodding up, but you just it's like the essential self, what we were reading in that book. Oh yeah, the North defining your North Star. Yeah, North Star. Where like you feel yourself kind of nodding up, but you go and do it anyways because you're supposed to do it and you have to do it. (laughs) Oh, and you're just like all contorted trying to deal with this person, whereas your body's just telling you no. Yeah, I think one thing she even mentioned in that book too is like you know when you're interacting with certain people, does it feel like you're like kind of like losing energy in the muck? Right. Kind of like wading through like a swamp to get there because, you know, one that like part of you knows that it's going to be draining. 
So it is draining, physically draining. You know it's going to be a negative experience, but that, obli- that, that social obligation is really dictating your actions rather than you controlling your actions. And I think this is, this is the difficult part for all of us because this is not an easy... Interacting with people is not easy because you know interactions are very much dictated by social norms. I mean, a lot of times that's what guides our social interactions. But finding really good, healthy, positive relationships, they have to be really done ind- independently on your own, I think. You have to listen to yourself, not society, to find those positive relationships. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share something that uh, I learned yesterday. Oh. So I'm listening to this book called Atomic Habits, and I've been avoiding reading this book for a while because it was a very popular book. And Is that James? Clear. Clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clear, yeah. yeah. And so one thing that he shared in that is that goals are something that oftentimes keep us from happiness. Because when we have these goals... We, have, we say, when I'm a millionaire, then I'll be happy. When I have that nice beach house, then I'll be happy. When I finally have this degree, then I'll be happy. When I'm married and have the perfect partner, then I'll be happy. So we put all these things between ourselves and happiness. Whereas, if instead we say, this is my goal. I need to implement this system. Then the actual implementation of that system to get you the goal provides happiness because you're actually doing the thing you need to do to get there you get happy in doing that and so it's kind of i see the same thing in relationships where a lot of us think that we have to have these toxic relationships in order to get us to some goal that we want that will eventually give us happiness but that's like that's a faulty model whereas instead you could just say i don't want to have the best relationships possible what are the systems i can put in place to develop those relationships so the the simple system could be does this feel good does this not feel good it feels good okay let's do it it doesn't feel good okay let's not do it i like that idea too because it sounds like what you're saying is like you know our idea of like family is causing us to maintain these toxic relationships say or our idea of friendship that you know a long friendship is worth more than our happiness in that interaction or somehow worth more than even the pain that we go through in interacting with the person. Even though we recognize that it's toxic and harmful, we put up with it because of these larger ideas Mm -hmm. about what it means to be a good person or to have a good life or what have you. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, it's true that even in good relationships, there are difficulties. Honesty is challenging sometimes. It's hard to communicate. But when Mm -hmm. you find that, I think the value of it is so high that it outshines everything else very easily. Definitely. I like that idea. That was a good way to, to tie in Atomic Habits. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it remi- you know, it, it's funny too, because I think having those, having goals, it's not just, like you said, it's not about the end. It's about the goal gives everything, it can give everything meaning. Mm-hmm. It can give you purpose, and that can be the happiness in, in working towards it, in the process. Yeah. Isn't it funny that, like, they teach us all of these wrong uh, beliefs early on, like, <laughs> the, end, the end justifies the means, and... Uh, I can't think of the other one. <laughs> but yeah, they teach us all these faulty models early on. Oh, I think, therefore I am. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, you are, therefore you think. Therefore you think. It's yeah. the opposite direction, right? Yeah, but they, they teach us all these faulty models early on, and then we're supposed to just believe them. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I find, you know, very early on, we're taught to ignore ourself. We're taught mm. to ignore our feelings. We're taught to ignore... So that we real... can fit into society. Yes, exactly, right? We're taught to fit into molds. Rather and than it, to define ourselves. And it's funny because we're taught to fit into a society that was outdated 200 years ago. Yeah, right? Where yeah. we're bound to be unhappy yeah. because they don't, the, the norms don't even apply that yeah. they're teaching. And then you get up, you, you learn later in life that you need to be yourself. And, you know, you need to realize your agency, realize yourself. And all this crap that you have, all this baggage of social life is really just getting in the way. Totally <laughs> worthless, yeah. It is interesting, right? But this is really, I mean, I think that's the core issue with dealing with people is people struggle because they have these ideas of social norms, of ideals from society that most of the time are outdated. Most of the time are influenced by things that have nothing really to do with healthy relationships or healthy social interaction. And so fundamentally, they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I see it a lot where people seem afraid to interact without a computer screen in between, or without oh, a screen yeah, in between them, right? I mean, look They're, at the whole dating world. That's gone oh God. totally digital. Like, yeah. you can't, you can no longer go up to someone and tell them they're pretty and ask them out. That's like, whoa, yeah. she go crazy, crazy. Well, yeah. you know, it's like that, that cancel culture. Everything is, you have to walk on eggshells shells for literally everything anymore. And it's gotten to the point where it gets very difficult, mm-hmm. which is why good relationships are important though, because you have somebody you can be honest and open with. 
Yeah. You don't have to hide yourself. You don't have to hide who you are. Yeah. Hmm. So that's a good point. Yeah. Let's see. There was some other point that I wanted to add about relationships, but it escaped me because we started talking about other things. Well, we digress a lot. I know. Yeah. It is, it's it'll very come, easy. It'll though. come back. If it I don't think about it's it. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So I think. So you know, when we think about dealing with people in general and relationships, you know, what are your suggestions too for like you know. Because, like, we, we were talking more about friendship right now. But what about, like, people in terms of, like, the workplace or, like, in other settings? Because we were really talking about relationships in the sense of healthy family friendship relationships is what we've been focusing on. Mm-hmm. What if we shift focus a little bit to either, like, you know, the All workplace, right. online, yeah. Perfect. This It came, it actually came back to me. I knew I'd get it back Yeah, there. stop thinking about it. It came back. So, like, sometimes in, in workplace situations, we're stuck with certain people. Okay? And, and sometimes in family, you're stuck with certain people. Uh, so you can be, you can be kind, but here's another thing. We've talked a lot about the simple delights. We have. Yeah. Okay. And this is, this is a habit that has uh, impacted my life in such a positive way that there's no way I could actually state the benefit. And you know what? It's so simple. It's insane. (laughs) It takes, it takes five minutes at the end of the day. And the payoff is incredible. Yeah. So basically at the end of the day, before I go to bed, I just sit down with a pen and paper and I write down the three best moments of my day. Oh, you do it at night too? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so do I. It's awesome. Yeah, so I just write down, you know, like, today I got to enjoy a fire outside with my dad because I really loved spending time with him and, uh, you know, whatever it may be. So I'll write down three different things. And that makes such a positive impression both on my mind before I go to sleep, but also on my life from day to day because I'm able to to stop and recognize those moments. Like everybody has this idea that when they finally get everything lined up, life will just be perfect and blissful forever. Yeah, yeah. But it's not. It's just a collection of little moments. And it's like, ooh, this moment I can enjoy the blue sky. Ooh, this moment I can enjoy the snow while it's still here. Ooh, this moment I can enjoy whatever. And it impacts your positive attitude so much, but it also helps literally with everything else in life. I think the point you're making is very good because, you know, I noticed that myself. I haven't even made my point I know, yet. but I know where you're going. Because <laughs> I feel better all the time now that I started doing that. And, like, it helps you stop, too, and catch yourself and get your perspective corrected when you are struggling. And you realize those little moments are everywhere because you're right, you know, so many people do think, oh, I get this, I'll get this, I'll retire, things will be dandy, it'll be awesome, that'll be great. But it's not gonna change anything unless you work on yourself now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's the only way it changes. Yep, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. Like I've traveled all across the world and wherever I go, I'm right there with me. Yeah, it's the weird thing, right? You always bring yourself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, So the point that I was going to make So we do this book of small delights activity uh, in terms of life, but also it's something that you can do with people. So we're so quick to find the flaws with people and to find the negative things with them. And every time you do that, catch yourself and then say, okay, what's something positive about them? That is a great point. You know, gratitude for the people in our lives and in general, because it helps us also see them as a person. Because, you know, when we always focus on the negative, we don't see the other individual as an individual, right? We start, to, we start to break them down into these parts like, oh, they have an annoying laugh, or oh, they do X, or you know, they do Y, they don't finish their work on time, whatever. And we don't really think about them as an individual and what's positive about them. And it's just like anything else, right? It's our attitude. Our attitude will change how we look at people, how we look at things. Yeah, and your mind just kind of gets goes down these tracks. It goes down these rabbit holes. So if, you, if you're going down the negative rabbit hole, you'll find one thing negative and then another negative and more and more and more. But if you catch that and then you say, okay, what's positive? Your mind will start going down the positive rabbit hole. You know, I'm glad you brought that up too because, you know, one thing I've noticed too is like, you know, with work these days people feel the pressure of work all the time because with email you know phones internet you know they basically work 24 7 now and i think that is part of the problem you're you're so stressed out and you're so you know moving from one thing to the next so quickly that you never take the time to stop and look at the world around you you're always sort of in a different place distracted and that's what i love about the small delights and i i love the idea of applying it to people because i've been doing that as well and it really does help it helps you be grateful for the people in your life. It helps you, you know, make sense of your world in a way that makes it a lot better and more pleasant and just, you know, a better world to be in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, you know, So that's my idea. What's yours? That's a great idea. <laughs> oh, well, come on. How can I live up to that? <laughs> Jesus. No, I was going to say, too, I think in addition to that, too, I think that, that is a great idea, you know. 
focusing on small delights. The other thing too is I think, you know, we, we talked about communication early on. I think we do forget the power of actually honest conversation. And I think we're all so afraid to have honest conversation because it seems scary because, you know, it's, it's outside the social norm because it seems like we're rocking the boat or whatever. But, you know, an honest conversation doesn't have to be negative. You can start a conversation with people to find things out. And I'll give an example. Like, you know, this happens a lot with my students where all the student who's doing fairly well in class and all of a sudden they stop submitting work or something like that, or starts coming in late. Now, I could just let that go. I could grade them accordingly, and their grade will plummet probably in the course, and it'll do terrible. More often than that, though, I reach out and I say, look, what's going on? I don't talk about the assignment. I just say, what's going on in your life? Because obviously, I can tell something's up. And usually, that'll get an honest conversation starting where I find out, oh, you know, somebody in their household's sick, or this happened with their pet. It's something maybe that they didn't think was important enough to reach out, but it's enough that you recognize that, hey, that's influencing what's going on with them, and that's causing them to perform differently. And once I address that, then we can move forward together and work out something that works for us, right? Because I think most of us forget that most people are pretty amenable to finding a solution that works for both parties if you approach them in the right way. You know, we tend to do it very standoffishly. When we talk about work, I think that's that's an important thing. It doesn't mean it's always going to work. You had the issue at work, I know, where, you know, that didn't really work. You tried it, and you know, so you move on, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. But I really, yeah. I really like what you said there uh, for two for two reasons. So one, you say have a conversation, because believe it or not, we can't read each other's minds. No, I know it's hard. <laughs> but but also, what I really like was that it was an open ended conversation. You said, "Look, what's going on?" You leave it open to the other person. They can say anything. They could say nothing. They can yeah. do whatever. Instead of being like, why are you so critical? What's yeah. your problem? You know, but you, you left it like, you left it very open and it allows them to say whatever. Because who knows? Chances are, chances are it's not what you think it is. Well, exactly, right? And if you give people the chance, if you give them a space to explain themselves that's free of judgment and open and they recognize that, they'll take it usually. And, you know, I think we, we, we are so quick to judge others for failures, like, you know, they're having a bad day, whatever. When, when we have a bad day, we want all sorts of attention and we want all sorts of help and we want all sorts of handouts. So really, when you think about it that way, right, you know, it's like you should be considerate of their mood as well. I mean, again, this doesn't solve every problem, but I think it is important because we're so quick not to, like you said, we're so quick to focus on the negative. We forget the positive and we forget we're interacting with people. Yeah. One of the things that's helped me out so much at work is when people are are grumpy or gruff or just like, you know, I don't get the response I'm expecting. Just almost subconsciously in my mind, I'm just like, oh, they're probably just having a bad day. And I just go on. I just move on with it. And and so often that's true. Like usually by that afternoon, they're fine. Well, yeah, because right. I mean, how often is it necessary? We, it's funny, though, because we interpret it like as if it's about us. Yeah. Right. Like, you didn't smile at me. It must be me. You know, I must have made you mad. I must have done something that upset you when they might not even have noticed. Mm-hmm. You know, there could be so many freaking answers and explanations for it. And I think that's our problem. Right. We jump to conclusions because we're trained to do that. And we jump to these conclusions that are often wrong or misplaced. But if we give people a chance or if, like you said, just say, ah, they're probably having a bad day. Move on. If it's a small thing, who cares? Does it really affect you? No. I think that's a great point. I like that. (sighs) So, how to deal with people? Well, you have to deal with them a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't have a choice in that matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think one thing, too, is I think, you know, we've talked about positivity a lot and a positive attitude. And I honestly do think, you know, when you cultivate a positive attitude, your interactions with people improves anyway. Because you are positive. I noticed that, like, you know, take, for instance, like, I was, uh, I went out to the store the other day and you know, it's, I feel like so often now I see these people like flipping out at people that work at these stores and it's like, one, they don't get paid a lot. They're always understaffed. They're on skeleton crews. I mean, you know, give them a break. And I think if you start cultivating positivity and you have a positive attitude, you not only recognize this negativity all over, but you also don't contribute to it. And people respond to you in a way better, I mean, they're just better place when they respond to you because they see you're not putting pressure on them. You're not trying to demand something. You're not criticizing. You're just trying to interact with them to make the little bit of interaction you have more pleasant. And I think there is something to that as well. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head there with if you want to interact with positive people, be positive. Yeah. It's, it's basically like you should act to be the type of person that you want to interact with. Oh, kind of like... um 
the golden rule, sort of. Kind of. Kind of. A little like, bit. He who yeah. has the gold makes the rules. Yeah, that that's one? it, right? Yeah, I think so, right? <laughs> but it makes so much sense. Like, you know, I've heard that I've heard that in the dating realm that if you wanna if you wanna attract really beautiful women, you need to be the type of person who attracts really beautiful women. It's not about like learning these seduction techniques and everything. <laughs> yeah. It's like you just go out there and be the you be the honey for the bee and the bee will come to you. That's it. Well, I think that's true for all of our interactions, right? Is if we're more positive and if we're confident and if we if we seem if we seem sure of ourselves, people respond to that. And they they take to it and it makes sense, right? Because you're not, you know, if you're negative, you're making everyone else's day worse. And they see it and people realize it and they expect it. And I think when you give them the expectation of positivity and niceness, which is not even hard to fake, you know, even if you're having a bad day, there's no reason to make other people feel that way. You know, if I'm stressed out and I'm having a bad day, I'm not going to take it out on the guy at Wawa in my two-second interaction. There's no reason, right? They have their own shit to deal with. There's no reason to do that to these people. So I think, like, I think that's a big factor, too, is also, you know, we've been talking a lot about the other person. Check yourself, right? You know, think about your own attitude. Think about what you're bringing to the table. And think about, are, am I influencing people in the way that I would want to be influenced by this interaction? And I think those are some good ways to kind of reframe how we think of social interactions and relationships, that we make it about our own agency and about our attitude and what's in our control. Isn't it funny? Like, the answer always comes back to <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, doing the best you can, acting within your own realm of agency. Well, I think that's the problem, right, is we so often look outside of ourselves for blame, right? We look, I mean, especially nowadays, Christ, everything is about victimization and blaming others. And it's like... At the end of the day, though, and I, I find myself doing it sometimes, too, and I hate it. Because I know, at the end of the day, it's my attitude, my actions are in my control. I can improve my situation if I want to, or I can keep interpret it, interpreting things in a shitty way, and things will be shitty. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's difficult, but it's true. I mean, I think the hardest thing is we have such a hard time moving out of that mindset because it seems so easy. And we've talked about this before, right? Choosing the more difficult thing in the moment for greater payoffs later rather than choosing the easy thing now which leads to more pain later bingo yeah yeah so i think that's how you deal with people in a nutshell i think it's how you deal with people yeah all right all right perfect well thank you guys for listening to episode 24 how to deal with people from the existential stoic podcast please if you like the show subscribe and share right those are the things they need to do and also make sure you catch us midweek for the quick fix oh yeah for the quick fix we'll have another one out this wednesday Mm -hmm. awesome later danny later andy